Oh, good morning, everybody. I've been sitting here looking stupid. Um, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of RV Talk Live, coming to you from Edmonds, Washington, on the shores of Puget Sound, just north of Seattle. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're recording this live on June 21st, 2014. So if you're watching live, <clears throat> welcome. Excuse me, my goodness, so early to have problems. <clears throat> if you're watching this live, uh, then uh, pr please feel free to participate in our chat. And if not, we hope you enjoy the information. Happy summer. It's a gorgeous day here in Edmonds. I hope it is where you are. And uh, today we're going to talk about RV electricity with uh, a couple of great guys who know a lot about it. Mike Sokol. I don't know anybody who's got the knowledge of RV electricity that Mike does. He'll be joining us from Maryland. Um, also joining us from Springfield, Massachusetts, will be Chris Doherty, our technical editor of RVTravel.com. And uh, Chris is no slouch at electric uh, his knowledge of RV electricity as well. Um, so stay tuned. And if you're a YouTube subscriber, you'll see a chat box on the right of uh, the screen where you're viewing this. And please feel free to participate, ask questions, comment. Um, it'll really help the show, and please just, if you've got a question, just ask it. We'll try to get to as many as we can. This segment of RV Talk Live is sponsored by the fine folks at SteadyFast. With the SteadyFast system, you'll do away with virtually all unwanted movement in your parked fifth wheel or travel trailer. Permanent installation is easy, and then at the campground, it'll take you about 45 seconds to set up the system and you'll stop the rockin' and the rollin'. Okay, now to tell you about Mike, because he's the guy who knows about RV electricity. He's been uh, in the industry for 40 years, uh, involved in electrical design, building, and troubleshooting. He's an instructor for the how-to sound workshops where he teaches advanced audio mixing and, all writes, and also writes the No Shock Zone blog Many of his articles appear on rvtravel.com. You're probably familiar with them. Um, he just published his first ebook, and I recommend this if you want to know everything about RV electricity. Uh, it's called RV Electrical Safety. It's available at amazon.com. Uh, if you're chatting, you'll see the URL right there. Uh, a print version will be coming out next week if you prefer to get it that way. Uh, but I'm telling you, this is, should be essential reading for every RVer. And now, gentlemen, I have a question for both of you. So feel free to weigh in. How are our electrical systems on our RVs different from the electricity that we deal with at home? That's the basic question. Anybody hearing me? So, yes, I've got you. OK. so. Um, let me jump in here first. Well, the, I guess the two main things that are different about uh, RV electrical systems, technically, um, I'm not hearing you anything. have 12 volt systems, 12 volt DC battery systems intertwined with 120 volt AC systems at the same time. Um, with, um, from a practical standpoint, Fine on batteries. Easily be um, cut through. Um, so, I mean, those are the three things on my hit list. What about you, Chris? Uh, well, absolutely. That's very uh, pretty much what you said. You have the, the two different systems, and of course, then you're also connecting into the campground uh, electrical system. Right. Uh, and that's how you're going to get your AC system or through a, an onboard genset or inverter system. Gentlemen, I am not hearing you. We're having some technical problems. I did not hear that <clears throat> answer, so while we're working things out, I'm going to ask you another question. I trust you answered the first one. And that is that a really common question that we get here or that we talk about is what's called a hot skin condition on RVs. Um, I think I'm hearing you now. So would you both weigh in on what a, a hot skin condition is, how it happens, and how it can be prevented? Okay, uh, a hot skin 
um, is when the the chassis of your RV and the and the skin of it has has its voltage has been elevated above earth ground, let's say. So, you know, if you measure the earth below your feet, it should be, well, zero volts. Um, if something happens to the grounding system on your RV, then it can be elevated to 40, 60, even 120 volts. And so if you were to touch the ground, let's say standing in a puddle and your door handle or whatever at the same time, um, then you become the connection between the, the, the hot skin and the earth. And this gets, gets very dangerous. It does not take very much current at all to uh, stop your heart or cause other injuries. I mean, we've, I've heard, there was a story last year about a, a family, uh, uh, a teenage boy was killed and uh, uh, the RV in the backyard was having some sort of a condition and it, the, the, the family had been experiencing a tingling when they touched the door, so they wrapped a cloth around the door. Uh, you know, being like a lot of people really didn't understand how this, you know, what could happen, the consequences, and then a rainy day the boy went out and one foot on the, uh, the, the ground, uh, one right. foot uh, on the, and touching the handle, and it, uh, it killed him instantly. So this is definitely a serious matter that uh, people need to know it, about. It is a serious matter, and in, case, in that instance, I think they actually wrapped electrical tape around the door handle. So they, they had the presence of mind to know if you put electrical tape, it would stop you from getting shocked on the door handle. But of course, everything metal on a um, RV is connected to the chassis, so it was also electrified. And you're exactly right; he was on wet grass, and um, one foot on the wet grass, one foot on the um, on the metal steps, and it killed him. He was 18 years old, and he died on the spot. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, we want we tried to put up Mike's address for his book um, on YouTube chat. They won't let us do it, so we will have that available on uh, the archives of this. And you can write me, Chuck, at rvtravel.com, and I'll send you the link to that book. So uh, sorry about that. We're still learning. This is our second webcast. Um, either of you have any questions from uh, readers, viewers that have come in? I know some questions have can come in this morning. Uh, do, do one of you want to pick something out, and uh, we'll start with that? I, I, want to I check do. In. Yeah, I sure do. Um, yes, I have a question uh, for you. And uh, uh, Joe... Joe Gilmer writes, uh, this bulb came out of my 2013 Cougar fifth wheel. I have three pendants hanging over the island, and uh, the bulb got hot enough to melt the lead contact around the contacts inside the light fixture. And uh, he goes on to describe that the bulb locks itself inside the fixture, and the only way to remove it is to use leather gloves to bend or break the melted lead bulb contact. Um, and he's used the second bulb in the same fixture doing the same thing. And he's looking for some help with that. Uh, now, I think we have a picture uh, of that light bulb, and uh, I think it's pretty clear what the, the problem is, Mike. Oh, yeah. The, um, the, the, the trick is that's a standard bayonet-style bulb. That's the little latch in the bottom. Um, they're not all the same. Some of those mm -hmm. are brake light bulbs. Some of those are, uh, are light bulbs for uh, continuous use. So if you have a, a, a bulb in there that's, that's really for brake, light, brake lights, and if you notice how bright a brake light is on a vehicle, if you leave that on constantly, it will get hot enough to melt the fixture and possibly catch things on fire. So I believe that you've somehow down the line re replaced the correct bulbs with an incorrect bulb. So just because it fits in there and it comes on does not mean it's right. You need to go back and confirm it's like a dome light bulb. You know, it's really funny. And the bases it's are different uh, on those, Joe, and that if you take a look, uh, you'll see that you have two contacts on the bottom of that bulb. And when you're looking at the base uh, inside the interior fixture, uh, you'll most likely see one contact. Uh, when you have a brake or tail light bulb, it'll have those two contacts, one for the high power filament and one for the, the lower power one. Uh, right. Somewhere on that fixture, if it's not visible to you, if you take the fixture down from the ceiling, should be a sticker or even etched in the base of it itself, uh, will tell you what type of bulb to use in that fixture, and you should be using the correct one. You know, it's really, it's really, uh, I can admit my ignorance when I started off that I did this exact same thing because I remember my little plastic uh, covering on the light was, it had melted or burned away in the middle, and I'm sure that I was using uh, the wrong light. But, you know, I think a lot of people might, 
wouldn't Mike, wouldn't you recommend that you label or Chris label these bulbs? Because I mean, we do carry spare bulbs in our RVs and for the brake lights, for the tail lights, whatever. Um, I mean, these look enough alike that most people might easily uh, mistake them, right? I think that's a really good idea that you should, um, you know, put them in some way to separate them in a, in a baggie or whatever, and note that that would be for your pendant lights or whether it's a brake light bulb. I might note also that some vehicles, including my Sprinter, which I have, mm -hmm. if you get the wrong brake light bulb installed in there, it will shut down cruise control, all kinds of other things. The electronics in your Sprinter Class Bs will start acting really crazy and it's just because you have the wrong brake light bulb in your sprinter so i would be really careful when i start plugging those babies in because they are not interchangeable definitely yeah that's I, i'm surprised that the uh, th that those would be connected the house lights with the, the the engine system is that what you're saying no 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 i'm saying that on your sprinter yeah your your um your brake light bulbs in the back. Yeah. If you were to accidentally put one of those overhead light bulbs in place of uh, a brake light bulb, oh, okay. it will shut down everything on your Sprinter. Okay. And I, how do I know this? You did it. Yeah, I, I, I know. I did it. And I've had a number of people do it. So if you accidentally put one in that's wrong and it shunts across, the Sprinter is really, really smart. It's got tons of computers inside. Mm. It'll think something has gone wrong. It'll disconnect cruise control. It'll put it into limp home mode. It won't shift out of third gear. It'll do some of the craziest things you can possibly imagine if you have the wrong kind of brake light bulb in it. So be careful. You don't get a brake light bulb in an overhead pendant and don't get a pendant bulb stuck back in the slot where it's supposed to be a brake light bulb. Okay. Um, again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, uh, Steadyfast, for its support of this program. If you... Uh, in this segment, if you have uh, a trailer that, or a fifth wheel that likes to wiggle like this, uh, check out the SteadyFast system at SteadyFast.com. It'll keep it nice and quiet, uh, uh, nice and solid uh, when you're walking around uh, when, uh, in, your, in your vehicle. And thanks, Paul Haskam, uh, there for supporting us. Uh, a question just came in via chat. Is it safe to run two 15K AC units when hooked to a cheater box with 30 amp on each leg to the cheater? Okay, I don't know. What do you guys say? Uh, a cheater box, are they referencing a pair of 20-amp uh, connectors that, oh, no, not to a 30-amp. Yeah. No, you can't take two cheaters and, and use them to connect up to a common 30-amp connector. There's no way to do that. Yeah. Um, you can do the, the cheater cord that will bring you in two services into a 50-amp input. You can do that. Um, you're still limited to the amount of current available from each receptacle so if one was a um, let's say you plugged into a 30 and to a 20 amper service with your two cables uh, the one side would be limited to 30 amps total draw and the other one would be limited to 20 amps total draw so you would have 50 amps total to play with um, but there's no way that I can think of Chris unless I'm missing something here you can't really take two connectors two cheater cables and then run them into a common 30 yeah, no, there isn't. And one of the other concerns that you're going to run into <clears throat> is that in a lot of states uh, and with newer services, uh, uh, the, the campground services I'm talking about, is that they'll have uh, GFI or ground fault interruption uh, on that. So if you use one of those cheater cables, uh, like you mentioned, it will trip the GFI on the 20 uh, right. uh, amp or 15 amp receptacle, whichever they have installed. Yeah, basically that. GFCI, you cannot intermingle neutrals at mm -hmm. all okay. with GFCIs because it'll get confused and it'll think something bad is happening and it will shut down. Yeah. The other thing that you can run into in some parks, especially ones that have been around a while, depending on how they've been wired, is that uh, they wire to save some money. They wire the park uh, to handle the largest single receptacle on the campground uh, pedestal. So if you have uh, a 30 amp uh, receptacle and a 20 amp, the 30 amp is going to be the, the maximum amount you can get. So if you were to use one of those cheaters, for instance, you could overamp it and actually trip the breaker back in the main panel of the campground. So then right. they have to go and find a way to get someone with a key to go and reset it. And having been in the campground business, I remember having to do that before. So, 
uh, RV Park electrical systems are not all created equal, are they? I mean, there's a lot of them out there that are old and have not been dealt with for a long time. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some old campgrounds, and and that's one of the conversations that's come up in the in the camping business over the years is that you have older campgrounds that were designed for older units that didn't have the electrical demands that our coaches have today. And uh, newer parks now are putting in uh, better electrical systems, and as they upgrade, they're putting in better stuff. And uh, there's even growth uh, moving out in the, in the future. Mike, we were talking about that before. Yes, they're getting ready to um, the, the newest National Electrical Code, who who really controls all of this as it's wired in the United States, is proposing 100 amper services coming up for RVs. 100 amp, you know, so why, two legs of 100. Why would any? Why would anybody? I mean, I suppose these must be the gigantic uh, RVs that would well, demand this. I mean, isn't this a bit? I mean, recreational vehicle. That's. Well, this is I, not this I, is I not for pop-up traders, you know. Um, wow, that's. Uh, will the camp will is, will this be it's common in camp, um, will this be common in campgrounds or is it just going to be in the very high-end luxury resort type places? I, I we don't know yet, but they're they're yeah. making. I I think what's happened is the NEC is trying to get ahead of the curve a little bit and make recommendations so that when it happens, they'll have code already written for it. Yeah. So it could yeah, be some, a couple years, yeah. Um, and some of the larger coaches too uh, have uh, are all electric. So you're they're putting in residential electric refrigerators, electric water heaters, things like that. And uh, as people uh, want to have uh, more and more home-like amenities, uh, that amp draw certainly grows. So they they're going to have to eventually uh, meet up with that. So these 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 all electric coaches then, if they're out boondocking they're they're running off uh, um, a probably pretty impressive set of batteries number of batteries and well, yeah well yeah absolutely they'll have uh, one or two large inverters and a very mm -hmm. large battery bank uh, and they also will have generator systems uh, 12 and a half kilowatts uh, generators are not uncommon in a lot of those okay and, uh, they have a lot of demands before we go into our second segment here with a new sponsor, um, here's a quick question for you that's related to this. Uh, I don't have the name of who sent this in. We do have a photo with it. Uh, I sometimes can't find a 50 amp hookup for my fifth wheel and have to plug into a 30 amp pedestal. Are dog bone adapters dangerous? What's the disadvantage of using them? I never heard this, that uh, well, danger um, adapter, what does here. that mean? Here's here's my spin on it. Um, if you're going to buy something like that, remember that the um, uh, buying cheap is not the way to go. Um, I see a lot of these one-piece units um, that are, are imported, and they don't have the correct amount of type of wiring inside, and they can, you can lose connections, um, and they can actually burn up. Um, the the ones that are that have a separate wire down the middle and look like you know they're molded construction are safer. Just remember, though, you are limited to 30 amps total. Remember, a 50 amp uh, connector is really 100 amps, so it's 50 amperes times two separate lines. So you have 100 amps total draw in your coach that you can do, whereas a 30 amp is only a single connection. So you have, you have dropped your power um, availability from 100 amperes down to 30 amperes and the wattage and all of that still follows along so you basically have to throw away two-thirds of the stuff that you want to have on at the same time okay and um, one of the other things if I can chime in here yeah. uh, and Mike and I were talking about this before is that when you use those dog bone adapters sometimes you can over amp the connection uh, if you take a look here and I'm going to hold it up in front of the camera this is the end of an old extension cord and this is an interesting one because the end of it is clear, so you can see what's going on inside. And you see all this black here, and this is where it's burned and melted. Now, a lot of people, when they see their extension cords, they'll see the terminals uh, are starting to uh, melt down and crack around here. They may see the plug from their RV, and the individual terminals start turning pink, and the plastic melts around them. And that's because it's too much amps going through those uh, those terminals and also as they heat up uh, the contacts aren't good anymore you get resistive heating in there 
and uh, that causes a little bit more of a problem. Right, Mike? Yeah. Oh, remember, they can heat up enough to catch on fire. I have a video on my YouTube channel where I overamp an extension cord, and within five minutes, it's hotter than the boiling point of water. Really? And easily could catch on fire. And there's few things scarier, I think, for an RV is than, than to have a fire, especially an electrical fire. Yeah, I, I actually, I don't know if you guys know this, but I actually, my first RV caught on fire. So I'm going to tell you about this second. I'll tell you about that, and then we've got another question just came in via chat. Uh, uh, this is our second sponsor of the day. Um, thank you. Uh, sponsored by Wholesale Warranties. Uh, save 50% on your RV warranty if your RV is your 2000 or newer. Wholesale Warranties has an A-plus carrier and better business bureau rating. So be sure to check them out. RV uh, WholesaleWarranties.com if I said that wrong. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I had a little, uh, my first little RV had a, a wood frame. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the mount that, that, that kept the exhaust uh, pointing toward the ground, engine exhaust, uh, had broken and the exhaust had shifted and it was, the heat was blowing in on the frame. And it, uh, I was driving in, in a mountainous area with a lot of forest and I could smell smoke, but it sounded like wood burning. <laughs> so who would think? It wasn't electrical. Um, but then I looked back and there was smoke. But lucky for me, I was able to, I had, a, you know, I did have a fire extinguisher and I was able to put it out and no damage. But I mean, some of these electrical fires, engine fires, those are, uh, those are not pretty and disastrous. Here's our question uh, for, from David, uh, oh, I can't read the last name there. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, out of focus for me. I've been told that when my RV is in storage and hooked to shore power, 15 amp, I should have a fan running to lower the power feed uh, to charging the batteries. Do you recommend this and why? What was the, repeat the last part, should have yeah. a what? He says he's, uh, my RV's in storage and he's hooked up to shore power, 15 amp. Uh, should I have a fan running to lower the power power feed to charging the batteries. Do you know what fan that... Fan running. No. I don't even know quite what no. he means by that. No. No, no. No, that's... that's I, I would guess... Okay, so let's, let's just look quickly back to the old days of chargers where you had something we called a trickle charger, and it was going to put two amps into those batteries no matter what, and you could just boil those things right out in a matter of weeks. Um, modern um, maintenance chargers are smart enough to read the battery voltage and the temperature and will decrease the charging current accordingly. So based on, it's a, a very nice algorithm inside. So with a modern charger, absolutely no need to leave a light on or leave a fan running or any of those other things. I think that that's probably something left over from 30 years ago. Your father probably told you to do that. And it probably was good when your dad was doing it, I would, I would guess. Um, quick, let's go back for a second. Yeah, Dave O'Neill wants to know. Uh, coaches have. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Let me just get this in quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. Dave O'Neill uh, left a comment. He sure. said, what's a dog bone? We really didn't explain that. It, what is a dog bone? Other than a dog bone, you know, for a dog. Um, I'm not hearing you very loud. I, I think I'm just hearing you off an echo mic there. Um, Chuck, so I really can't, I'm not hearing the question very, very well. Okay. All right. Do you hear me better now? No, I can hardly hear you. You're all the way in the background. It's been a very low feed here the whole time. Okay. What's a dog I'm bone? I'm hearing you off of a secondary mic, but okay. not your primary mic. Okay. What's a dog bone adapter? What is a dog bone adapter? Yeah. Okay. Chris, you want to have a stab? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. A dog bone adapter is basically um, a converter. That's going to take uh, your, let's say you have a 50 amp uh, service in your RV. It'll take the 50 amp plug and convert it down to a 30 amp so that you can plug it into a 30 amp receptacle if that's all you have at your campground. And they have them also from 30 amp uh, down to 20 amp. And so the, the slang term for them are dog bone adapters. And sometimes you'll see they, there are sometimes some small round or triangular ones that will do 30 amp to 15 or 20 amp uh, also. Okay. And I think they call them a dog bone because it looks sort of like a dog bone. It has, you know, like six or eight inches of, of wire in the middle and then the two bulbous ends. So you can imagine your, your terrier grabbing onto that and running with it. That's, 
That's where I think the slang came okay. from. Okay, enough about that. Oh, um, uh, here's a question from Michael Martin. Will it hurt to run a wind generator and a solar generator at the same time? If they both have electronics that deal with it. So um, they're going to be look, looking at battery voltage and uh, battery impedance. It should be okay. It should not, should not have a problem. Um, but what you don't want to do is just arbitrarily hook solar cells or wind generator into the battery. So if both of them have their own independent charging system, whichever one has the stronger current is going to take over. And, the, um, and it may shut the other one back for a little bit, but that's okay. So when the, when the sun shines and you're getting charged, and when the wind blows, you're getting charged. Um, but only if you have those as completely separate, isolated charging systems connected to the same battery banks. Okay. Um, yeah, and they have 12-volt charge controllers that handle that. So uh, right. some, there's a bunch of different companies that manufacture them for the RV industry. Right. Okay, um, before we forget to talk about this, because we talked to readers, uh, our readers and said we'd be talking about it, summer's coming, there are wicked lightning storms in the summer. People really want to know, what do you do during a really bad lightning storm? I mean, I always wondered, should I unplug my, unplug my utilities? Um, what, what are some, what's your advice for your, in your RV? And of course, I understand that different RVs are going to be, um, uh, more vulnerable than others. So uh, what, what's your advice? Okay, I've actually discussed this with NOAA at length and, you know, have kind of their official recommendations and my recommendations. And so, so the first thing to remember is that an RV protects you from a lightning storm because o only if it's a metal cage around you. So if you're like in a canvas pop-up camper, you have zero protection in a lightning storm and you really need to go into um, one of the utility buildings or whatever that may be at uh, the campgrounds. Um, the second thing is a metal, a, a metal RV will protect you, but not protect its own electrical system. So the first thing I would do is simply pull, I would go out, shut off the breakers and disconnect from your, um, your pedestal. Um, and go inside and run off of uh, 12 volts. Um, uh, if you have an in onboard generator, I think it's safe to run an onboard generator, uh, taking, going and attempting to um, put your jacks on wood or plastic does absolutely nothing. Remember, um, it's an old wives tale that the rubber tires protect you that has absolutely nothing to do with this. Um, but leave your jacks down, disconnect uh, your, your 120 volt power, uh, run off of your inside generator if you like, but uh, I would not run off of an outside generator. That's just asking for trouble. Um, and so, Mike, uh, a quick uh, question for you. With uh, A lot of people ask about surge suppressors for RVs. Uh, does that help out in this uh, regard at all? And what do you think of those in general? It will. And remember, there's there's two different flavors of surge suppressors. One would be what you call just a pure surge suppressor, and it's going to be something like a MOV device or whatever, but it does not have any relays to disconnect you. It will prevent a nearby lightning strike from feeding up into the wires or, or voltage anomalies, like if they shut off a big water pump at a campground, you can get a voltage spike. That'll prevent that. The second type of voltage or surge protector is actually a voltage monitor, you know, a power monitoring system. It will have relays that shut down the power if it gets below or above a certain, below 105, above 130 volts or whatever, but they will generally also include the surge protectors. And I like to think of the surge suppressor as a spike arrester. I, I, I really don't like the word surge suppressor. It's way overused in the whole market. So this the so that's a good thing. They will always help. Um, I think it's the best thing that you can add to any RV that, that plugs in is some sort of a, a good power monitoring system. And there's a, a number of them represented here that you can find very easily um, that do an excellent job of disconnecting you if the power goes too low, goes too high. Um, but nothing, and I mean nothing, can protect you from a direct lightning hit. It won't protect your electronics, but if you're inside of an RV that's all metal, it will protect you, and that's the important thing. So if you're in a pop-up, you're in a pop-up. Uh, point on that is that with, uh, and I've seen this on a number of occasions, is that the cable TV connection in the park can also uh, oh. allow a lightning strike to come in, and I've uh, done at least three RVs where 
it's had lightning damage, not from the uh, 120 volt connection, but from the uh, uh, cable connection. Yeah, that's basically an antenna just waiting to get hit. So that can feed in and knock out all your electronics. So yeah, I think that's probably the safest thing if you're in a big storm um, to probably disconnect that. I will also remind you there was a someone just got killed at a campground recently from a big tree branch falling on their little pop-up camper during a storm. Yeah. So if you're in a camper that's not really rugged and you're under a tree, I would definitely find a different spot or go sitting your sit in your uh, vehicle or whatever but um, yeah that just happened in the last month um, again so you're in a fiberglass RV you're in a uh, a pop-up you're not really protected are you a fiberglass RV as long as it has a metal frame will probably protect you because it kind of has a cage but um, you know the 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 older wooden fiberglass ones they're not going to protect you and the canvas ones or a tent uh, you might as well stand outside and hold up a golf club. I mean, yeah. it's really it's this, the equivalent danger. So if you're so in an RV even, park, uh, if you're in an RV so park. Even a typical uh, stick and tin trailer, uh, you don't think, uh, even if it's a 35-foot travel trailer or a big fifth wheel, you don't think there's any protection there? No, there is a protection as long as it's got metal exterior. So okay, if it's got a tin exterior, then it's fine. The best ones of all are like Airstreams. Um, I think you could, you know, I've got one. I think you'd take a direct hit with that thing. It's shaped like an airplane. Airplanes, I've actually been in an airplane before when it got hit by lightning. It was um, pretty spectacular, but we landed safely. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Astrid from uh, Ontario, Canada. Does plugging in your unit to shore power wear down the converter? Wear down the converter? It doesn't um, uh, wear it down specifically. It uh, does operate the converter. Uh, when the uh, unit is plugged in, the converter is usually active, and that's what's providing two things for you. One is 12-volt charging uh, to your coach batteries, and the other thing is it's also supplementing the 12-volt power throughout the coach for your lights, your uh, circuit boards, for your various appliances and things like that. As far as it wearing it down, no, I don't think there's any particular wear, but they do sometimes fail from various reasons. Uh, yeah, but I would say that modern electronics really don't wear out. In fact, it's best if they're turned on. What, what, what injures them is if you don't turn them on for several years, and then connections get corroded and that sort of thing. Um, so to be the best way to keep your electronics happy is to use them and exercise them. That way they, they, uh, they get warm, they don't get moisture inside of them. Um, so yeah, there's no wearing out of, uh, of modern electronics, especially converters, inverters, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, again, uh, I'd like to take up uh, that. I have another uh, question here from Chuck McMahon. Uh, he writes, how feasible is it to supply 120 volts AC from our truck's 12 volt DC power supply using a pure sine wave inverter? Uh, his truck has uh, two uh, 220 amp alternators, and he has a large capacity uh, DC source, which I assume are the batteries. And he says he can either install an inverter in the truck bed or in the RV, um, but it's going to require a lot of wiring. Now, we talked a little bit about this, Mike, uh, before. What are your thoughts? Um, remember, when you're converting amperage, uh, when, you're, or so when you're converting voltage, whatever the voltage does if you step it up from uh, 12 volts to 120 volts there's a 10 factor in the amperage so let's say that you have let's say that you want to draw 20 amperes on the 120 volt side of this that implies that your inverter is going to have to be drawing 200 amperes from the battery which means it's really the best place to mount that would be under the engine hood you've got to make sure that it can survive the weather under there that's the first thing um, and the cables will have to be very thick, the size of welding cables to hook this up. Um, the second thing that you would want to do is now basically you're using your vehicle, your tow vehicle, kind of like, a, like an outboard generator. You will need to have a, a plug on the outside of that that's weather, um, that's weather rated. And I believe that um, he was showing me beforehand some of these new marine grade mm -hmm. plugs. I think that that would survive that very well. Uh, but on your RV itself, you're going to want to make sure that your shore power, twist lock or whatever it is, needs to be moved so it's close to 
the the fifth wheel point, you know, where you could hook up, and that wants to make you want to make sure that that also is rated um, for w whether while you have something plugged into it while it's running down the road. So I, I think yeah. if you changed out your um, your connectors and make sure that they were moved close enough that they could do it, it would work. But you're going to have to you're going to have to get this professionally installed. This is you're not plugging this inverter into a cigarette lighter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, and that's what we were talking about with the smart plug, smart plug system. You know, that's weather tight, so you could have one in the front of the coach, and then you'd have to re, uh, change your uh, shore power cord on the coach. Uh, either have it come into a transfer switch, or uh, whether it's manual or automatic, and then that has to go through something like the uh, the smart plug, like we said, with a heavy cord going to the truck. So it's a pretty pretty advanced uh, installation. Yeah. And just one last thought on this. I'm hoping you're not intending for anybody to be riding in the fifth wheel while you're going down the road. I think that's uh, illegal in most states, yeah. is it not? It is. Uh, absolutely. Riding in any kind of a trailer in, in the majority of the states is a good Yeah, there, yes. there are some... And not a good idea. Some states will, will let you do it, but you should never do it. Um, uh, let me, uh, we've got a question here from Tom Robertson. He says, I'm a rookie, but looking to go full-time in a fifth wheel. What are your feelings on smart batteries? And is there a maximum number of batteries you can put in a fifth wheel to allow more boondocking? Uh, I think we should probably save this question for a future webcast because okay. battery hookups and amperage capacity is its own world out okay. there. I mean, I could go on for a half an hour about okay, this. Let's, um, um, let's just table that question for our, our, our next webcast. How's yeah, that? Well, well, let's do a whole webcast on batteries. Um, yeah. Let me do one more time. Thank RV Wholesale Warranties uh, for sponsoring this segment of RV Talk Live. Again, if you're getting a warranty for your, um, for your RV, be sure to check out wholesalewarranties.com. Uh, first, and uh, chances are you'll save a lot of money. So thank you very much to them uh, for um, helping us out here. Uh, do you have any more questions that have come in? We've only got about seven minutes left. I, I do have a real good one about um, using non-contact testers for hot skin. Um, okay, yes. And, and as you guys have seen a lot of my videos and articles that I've posted on, um, on RV Travel, um, those little non-contact testers that you can get for twenty dollars work great, but there's several different models of those things. I think you've got a graphic of that. And it, Mike um, would Mike would back up for a second here. Explain what you're talking about here. Testing for what? So what now? Well, explain to me what you're what this product you haven't explained. What what are we testing for here? We're checking for a hot skin condition, right? We're right. What we're looking for is a large metal body that has voltage on it. Now. These what we call a non-contact voltage tester, NV, N, yeah, NCVT. Um, they normally use them just for checking outlets to see if they're powered up. But my experiment showed that if you hold them next to something that's a large surface that's electrified, they go off real, real easily. In fact, if your coach is electrified, the body of your RV is electrified at 120 volts, they'll start beeping from a foot to two feet away. So it's a very simple test that you could do to make sure that your RV is not providing a shock hazard. Yeah. Um, um, there, there's several different types of testers. Um, the one that I most recommend are ones that are rated for, say, 90 to 1,000 volts. Um, that will detect a, a large surface down to 40 volts or so, uh, which is about the threshold of where electrical, you know, hot skins become dangerous. Um, I like the fluke testers. I think they're, uh, they're really, really good. Um, but what if you, what if you do this, for instance, I'm, I've got a, a one AC, a two here. I think you've got a graphic up. Um, that seems to work very, very well, uh, under all my tests. Klein makes one they call the NCVT one, which also, again, while it's rated for 90 to a thousand volts, it will detect any kind of a large surface um, down to 40 volts. And they're very useful for just double checking to make sure the plugs themselves, or I should say the receptacles, outlets at an RV campground, aren't, don't have swapped polarity. That is a neutral and hot, or not swapped accidentally. That's a really, really good test for that. Oh, you... Can I inject one other quick thing about sure. swap polarity? Yes. Swap polarity by itself does not cause an RV hot skin. What causes an RV hot skin is you have a loss of your ground bonding connection. And if your ground, if your, if your ground is lost, um, then there's a variety of things 
uh, none of which have to be specifically wrong. They can cause the, the voltage on your RV to elevate, um, and then it gets dangerous. So what you really want to do is always test after you plug in and hook up. Take your tester out of your pocket. takes a couple of seconds, and go test to make sure that your RV is um, not electrified. Um, they also make ones that are always on testers. That is, there's no on and off switch. I don't care for those very much because the battery can go dead in it, and then it can give you a false sense of security, and you think that the circuit is, is off, but it's not really. So any of the, the, the always-on ones, you have to go put, point them over at a known live surf, um, power source first just to make sure that they're still working. I've got one on my desk right here um, that just happens. To, I, I fired it up this morning. I said, oh, battery's dead. So yeah. I like the ones that have uh, the little blinky lights in them to kind of show you uh, exactly that they're on. Okay, gentlemen, that, that we're getting, makes me feel better. We're getting very close to the end here. Um, I, I want to inject a little disclaimer here um, uh, to everyone who's watching, and just be sure we've we've covered a lot of ground here, uh, in a way, and in another way, we've got a million questions that are unanswered, including. Uh, I said we've got one up here from Mike Martin and Mike uh, about inverters. We're going to have to get to that to another time, but always check with a technician about any of the things we're talking about if you have any questions you know uh, we're going so fast here we may not cover everything so it's real important that you uh, that you uh, do things right and that you always consult with an expert so uh, just use us as a, uh, a few guys sitting around here chatting and then covering the highlights do either of you have about one minute to sum up anything because we're we're virtually um, uh, we're two minutes away here Okay, real quick, um, you should never feel any kind of voltage tingle from anything. If you do, something is wrong. So you shouldn't feel it from your refrigerator, not from your RV, not from your blender. If you feel a shock, that is a hint that something is wrong and get a qualified electrician or RV technician to go check it out. Don't let it just be there because it could actually kill somebody. Chris? Absolutely. One of the other things that's come up a couple of times, but I want to reiterate it, is that when you are connecting your RV to the campground connection or to your house connection, you should turn the breakers off at the pedestal first before connecting your RV, then turn your breakers on and reverse that when you're going to disconnect. Turn your breakers off first and then pull the plug. Okay. Yep, All right. Absolutely. And I, here's my little tester mic that I, uh, tester mic, mic, I mean, you mic, not the microphone. Um, th this always comes out first thing. Uh, for me in the campground and you know if it's there's a little buzzer in here if I hear that um, I, if I know there's trouble I'll, I'll check things out and most of the time there's not going to be but you never know um, okay uh, before we go away here I'd like to remind you that next week uh, I'll be joined here with uh, uh, RV tire expert Roger Marble um, so we'll be talking about tie RV tires tire safety we'll talk about uh, tires from China um, uh, if, how good are those? Uh, we'll also answer your questions and a lot more. Talk about aging tires, how old is too, uh, too old of an RV tire. You know, we had a contest today, and we just got so busy here, we forgot to give away a prize, so we'll just have to do that next time. But anyway, uh, our time is up. I want to thank you very much for watching. Remember, this will be in the archives and uh, you can watch it at any time. We'll be putting up some more graphics. We'll have information on Mike's uh, f f fabulous book that is now on Amazon.com, and we'll have that information on the YouTube channel uh, description uh, and the video as well. So thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you here again next week on RV Talk Live.